I'm on my way to Daryl, my friend, my first homesteading film that I want to make. So Daryl has been homesteading as far as I know about five years, but we'll con confirm that. He's got some amazing systems, solar um, backup systems for the solar. He's got a biodigester. He's got uh, flower gardens. He's got some really, really amazing ideas. And I'd like to be able to share those and try and get some information out of him out of him with regards to like where did he go wrong how what was right Hi, I'm Daryl from EcoSynergy. Um, welcome to our farm. Um, I've got a few systems in place, all based in sustainability uh, principles, because I believe very strongly that uh, we all need to change direction in, in a way that uh, allows us to be more sustainable. Um, EcoSynergy is involved with practical solutions for sustainable living. Uh, some of the systems that I've put in place here I think are super handy and useful and, and essential, certainly when it comes to solar, um, with regards to being sustainable. So I'd really love to share some of these with you guys and, um, and we'll have some fun doing that. When I mounted my panels, I, start, I, I realized that it would probably be useful to, um, to be able to tilt them according to, to the sun. Uh, and this is obviously then based on, on the requirement of, of <clears throat> the panels to be as perpendicular as possible to, to the rays. I just devised a little fairly simple system that, that, that anyone practical could, could make themselves. I'll, I'll take you through how it works um, and essentially you'll be able to see in the background that there's a, a blank set of um, a, a stand waiting for panels. Uh, and that's still orientated at um, the, the summer pitch. Uh, and then this uh, present, current uh, working set of panels is, um, is set at, at, a, at a winter pitch and could go even steeper if we needed to. Solar panels just want to sit available to the light as much as possible, obviously facing the sun uh, as much as you can. This frame entails uh, a 50 mil galvanized pole, uh, which uh, basically acts as the axis and then um, the timber with um, a 51 mil hole drilled through there just uh, basically swivels on that axis uh, held by chains over there. Um, the, this is loose at the moment because it's not got the panels on, we've just moved it um, and we'll, we'll firm that up um, once the panels are on. Uh, certainly in the southern hemisphere where we are you need to be north facing as much as possible and once again if, if we're on a uh, an assumed permanent um, setup. They need to be as true north facing as possible. Be careful of magnetic north. As true north facing as possible and as perpendicular to the sun as possible. So that's why in this case to tilt them um, on the axis and try and get them to a much steeper angle in winter will be far more efficient and in summer we're going to tilt them right back down they'll be literally almost flat probably at about a five to ten degree um, angle which will be much better for the summer sun this is the old bank of uh, lead acids lead acid deep cycles they're not a bad not a bad um, not a bad battery but um, off grid with 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 this level of deep cycle is is they they take a hammering and uh, these guys are now dead after about six years what will you do with them now? Uh, actually, fortunately, this lead never gets wasted. The, the uh, scrap dealers will pay you about 
250, 250, maybe 300 rand per battery. And this is your new baby. Yeah, that's him. That's him. <coughs> this can store a total of 20 kilowatt hours um, and, and safely um, discharge 14 kilowatt hours. Um, that was when they only covered up to the 30 percentile. Now they cover up to 20 percent. So now it's actually called the 2016. So 16 kilowatt hours. And what's this over here? Okay, so usually um, any uh, off-grid system is going to need a backup. And this is a, a 5 kilowatt uh, generator that we have been very grateful to, to have uh, the last few weeks, last few months uh, actually, uh, while the batteries were dying a slow death. But what I've also realized is this was badly placed because my old set of batteries was here. My old set of batteries took up this whole wall. Okay. It was on a it was on a, a stand, and they stood here. So this space wasn't really available. Now that it is, I'm going to take this off the wall because it always interfered with the door anyway. So I'll, I'll move the inverter to there, take this guy over there, and then that guy can just swivel around there, and I'll be much happier. Sure. <laughs> Right, so this is the biodigester. Um, off the bat, I'm going to explain that this water on top here is in fact circulating on top of the, the dome. So just to eliminate any confusion, this is the final product, final digestate, which essentially is just being kept moving so that the, um, the, uh, everything stays in, in solution. And it then comes out here on these guys, which are essentially wells to collect the digestate. Something I haven't really spoken about, but that's another huge benefit of the, the digester, is that it provides you with this uh, nutrient-rich digestate, which, which can be obviously then redistributed um, around the farm. So <clears throat> this is the, the inlet chamber. Uh, and to imagine if um, we refer to the, um, uh, the plans, um, which we'll put on, <coughs> the these these structures go approximately two meters deep okay so that it's quite a it's quite a big structure quite a deep structure um, this is the inlet chamber where um, which first receives um, the organic matter from the sewage line and from the feeding um, the feeding bay or loading bay um, so this is this is where your organic matter will sit uh, in, in the water um, and allow the air to come out um, because once inside the reactor or the, the, where the digestion occurs uh, we can't have any oxygen so you are just excluding all, all the air from, from the matter at this point so it floats up to the top and anything that is solid and, and without any air will then sink through the little doorway at the bottom of this um, connection between these two structures. <clears throat> That makes its way into the reactor. That's where your, your main anaerobic uh, digestion is happening. Um, that's where all your bugs will then essentially be degrading the organic matter, releasing your methane uh, and carbon dioxide into the dome, um, uh, which is the fiberglass dome, which is essentially uh, orientated right underneath here. So there is a slight tiered structure because there's a dome underneath it. Um, and this just makes it uh, a little bit easier for me to then cascade off to keep it, um, keep it nice and, and circulating. Um, so under the dome, once the digestion has happened, only liquid then will, will then make its way through the little doorway between these two guys. That's your outlet chamber. From there, it goes into the facultative pond where any anaerobic bacteria are then killed because they, they're exposed to oxygen. Um, and ideally, in perfect conditions, I'd have a nice bright green algae growing on, on top there, which there was a, a few weeks ago, and now it's unfortunately um, been rained away. Um, but uh, essentially, that's what you also see is a massive algal bloom when there's a lot of um, nutrients in the water. And that's essentially what you see there, because it's just that that's your, your outlet. From there, the last, um, <clears throat> the last outlet is then this pipe which then brings it back 
to circulate over the dome. So I was just using this space. Uh, and because it was ideal, I just wasn't going to create something new. So I'm just circulating the, the, the last final digest date over the actual fiberglass dome underneath. Um, the fiberglass dome sends its gas through these pipes. One goes that way to a building that side. And this one comes through here and goes back up to the house. So that's where our cooking gas comes from. Um, <clears throat> as with most plumbing or, or whatever, you, you always need to have your isolation valves in case anything else needs to be done or for safety reasons you need to close off the methane. Um, it just looks like irrigation pipe. It absolutely is. This is 25mm um, class 12 pipe that you can get at any um, <clears throat> plumber. The interesting thing about biogas, um, it will <clears throat> basically form sulfuric acid if um, left to its own devices. It has a lot of sulfur in it um, and obviously water vapor as well. So before you use it, as it comes out of here, or there should I say, um, you do put it through a scrubber, which basically is, a, is, is iron filings that then extract the sulfur from, from the gas and leaves you just with the methane and the carbon dioxide, which is, is quite safe. You can make them yourself. Um, they're pretty inexpensive. Uh, the same guys who, who do the um, biogas appliances generally supply them. Um, the important thing is that it's uh, methane uh, safe. Usually plastic fittings like this are, are, are pretty good for methane, but any screw fittings um, require um, hemp and stag. Uh, that old-fashioned sort of plumbing method of, 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 of connecting pipes um, because methane is about four times um, more uh, smaller than than uh, air molecule. So this is so LPG is liquid petroleum gas and this is methane gas. Correct. It's referred to as biogas. Um, which is then made up of methane and a certain uh, proportion of carbon dioxide. Um, and they do behave differently, so the appliance actually does need to be different. Uh, the important thing, <clears throat> funnily enough, um, you know, someone did mention safety, um, is that LPG, because it sinks, okay, LPG is heavy, um, heavier than air. So if you do have a leak, it will sink to the, to, to the bottom of wherever it is, and if you're unlucky enough to be in a closed um, container, that, that container will slowly fill up with that LPG uh, until either someone lights a match or it just spills over, okay? That's why it's an explosive danger. Uh, methane is much lighter than air, and if it does escape from anywhere, it disappears, it's gone. So there's very little explosive danger. Um, of course, it's flammable, um, and if I was to light a, a match right next to the the pipe it would burn absolutely but just just like other <coughs> forms of of um, uh, uh, you know uh, dangerous gases um, <coughs> it requires oxygen as well so so as soon as it goes down a pipe and there's no oxygen it'll it'll defuse so so that's handy but um, one must realize obviously that there are explosive dangers around any um, flammable gases that you happen to be <laughs> producing. This is the feeding bay for the, the, the digester, <clears throat> um, which as you can see is full of flotation or floated matter, um, as well as any kitchen waste that um, is not worm friendly. So that's actually another really handy thing about this is that a lot of organic matter you can, you can, you can obviously put into a worm farm. Um, but worms uh, don't particularly like certain things like chili, garlic, anything that burns essentially. Um, so that can happily go in here. Um, this could take care of pretty much any organic stuff other than feathers and hair it doesn't like. Um, but it'll digest. It's essentially a big stomach. So this is going to... It gonna... doesn't stink though. It has, a, it has an odor, but I think, you know, to me it certainly is, is um, a bit like uh, cow manure. Uh, it is mostly cow manure as, as the, um, <clears throat> the main fuel, which you can see quite clearly, um, which is also quite handy because the cow manure floats to the top of this flotation chamber and forms a nice crust on top, okay, so that any of the genuine black water sewage that is still coming through this pipe 
isn't really seen or perceived. Wow. Unfortunately, we don't really, you know, see it too much. So, so, so this is a thing, um, which, as I say, maybe reserved for, for a, another episode, but, um, but what, this needs mixing. But the fundamental of this is that this is waste that would actually be in your septic tank. Absolutely. But you are now turning it into a resource. Exactly. And the, the only difference being essentially that this is, is the, the, uh, taking the septic tank to the next level because it's catching all that methane which would have been produced anyway. Okay. It is being produced. I think that's what, that's what people need to realize is that a septic tank is doing the same thing as this except that methane is going straight into the environment. I'm, cap I'm catching it and using it to cook and whatever else we can do with it. Um, so it's, it's definitely a, a huge benefit to the, to, to the environment and a huge bonus for us. So when that starts to then trickle consistently, what it means is that there's gas building up under the dome. Okay. So that's always a nice thing to see. <laughs> this is the final product of the biogas uh, or biodigester, should I say. The biogas will be coming out here, fed through the house into a, a scrubber we call um, or the um, sulfur trap and then it comes through here gives me a pressure reading over here which then is um, tells me roughly how much uh, gas there is in the dome um, and there we go that is methane burning nicely uh, and it actually burns at a much hotter temperature than lpg gas so um, that'll boil a kettle much quicker than uh, than LPG, a nice little thing or a full on blast. So, yeah, amazing. Okay. So, is this your veggie garden? So, this is our veggie garden, come flower garden. Um, it is a bit, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> being out here in the crags and, and, and with a forest right on our doorstep, um, we found very quickly that um, we were just feeding the wildlife. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you do have to unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> protect what you're growing come in so you've got a first, line of defense. first line of defense and then this is more for uh, the this little for guys the, bird. the birds So this is the veggie patch. This this is uh, where I like to walk around and enjoy, but I don't spend a lot of time doing all the work here. Um, I just don't quite have the green fingers that are required. Uh, and initially we started growing lots of veggies. Um, I also realized I'm just not a vegetable grower um, and it becomes harder work than, than it's necessary. And, and also just funnily enough, you know, things have just migrated towards then out of necessity uh, needing to grow more flowers than vegetables so take 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 a look in the in the hothouse yeah <clears throat> these avos come up beautifully in the um in the worm farm uh, i'm sure many people have seen that worm farms are, are fantastic um, and these are nurseries strawberry strawberries are going to be coming soon uh, they're quite happy up there off the soil they seem to get um, eaten by by something as soon as they touch the soil so that's a really nice way to just keep them nice and fresh nice. and you can just see that feel that beautiful up in five degrees temperature uh, and so this is your actual this is a monetary crop this so these are crop. these are all going to be um, flowers for for cut flowers uh, for bouquets and also for um, arrangements yeah so um, uh, Morkel has a, a huge passion for orchids and um, these aerophytes and, uh, and their flowers and, and babies and I think they're called pups. Um, he's using quite a lot in, in his arrangements now. So, so these are all uh, part of the business, yeah. <clears throat>
So the bigger, I think the bigger picture will always be sustainability for me. Like it's always about, yes, it's all very well to do it this way, but how long can it go forwards? And, and, and are you reliant on an external source of fuel? Because then it's not sustainable. So immediately you have to come back to, is it renewable? And how long will that last? You know, and how, or how easy is it to pr produce it? So for solar, it's easy, but now and then the sun ain't going to shine. And then you need a backup. And in this case, it's gas. Uh, in an ideal world, it would be biogas, um, but in this case, it's gas. I do have a plan for a few years' time. I'll build a little wetback on the fireplace. So then your option would be solar or wood. So this is this is basically, uh, you know, basically if, you, if you're wanting to, to drink and to provide your household with as clean drinking water as possible from rainwater, the first step would be to make sure that you're harvesting clean water, okay? A first flush, I think, in this kind of situation is essential. And all this does, if you watch these lines, rainwater is coming in here. First option has to go down here, falls down into this little guy. This is now collecting the first 20 liters odd of water that comes off the roof when it starts raining. That's your dusty water, maybe the, the first few leaves, etc., etc., that come off are just going straight in here. There's a little ball <coughs> at the bottom that floats <coughs> so he then <coughs> okay he then floats to the top and blocks off this hole so that the water then flows along there and into your tank so that's the first flush system just um, gives the the first 20 or 30 liters you can change that depending on your circumstances you can have a much longer pipe than this and flush off um, the first hundred liters if your if your roof is big enough then you flush off as much as you need to um, before it starts collecting and redirecting into your tank. Another extra little um, goodie would be to, to add that into your final um, inlet into your tank. And as you can see, I've caught quite a few little fine stuff that, that that's obviously then excluded from your drinking water, which you probably don't want in there. You want to have as little organic matter in there as possible because once again it is going to uh, oh you've got a filter yeah so oh, that's okay. just that's just an extra where do you get that that's also just uh most plumbers will, will, will buco at least um oh. who are these guys again eco jojo 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 oh, tanks. i must go get them yeah. um, <clears throat> you've got your incoming tanks um that are receiving water from the <clears throat> from the gutters directly it's filtered but then it's going through connected to the outlet tank okay so that outlet tank is actually could be completely sealed and is just sharing hydro hydrodynamically the water between the other tanks um, but ideally that one will will, will have no external input uh, and so shouldn't really get any organic matter involved in there at all so before we even get to the first flush, the gutter buddy or gutter mate, they call them lots of different things, but this is essential. I mean, and, and this is a total no brainer. You don't want to have to go up there to fish leaves out. Okay. That's a pain. You need a ladder. So rather just put your down pipe straight here. You don't have to stop leaves from getting there because they're going to come straight down the down pipe and get caught here. Once this is full, they just wash off because of the angle. Okay, and the water can carry on going down there and get collected. Perfect. You can take this off whenever you need to and just clean it out from whatever leaves gather up there. And that just, so that, <clears throat> that's your first exclusion of, of probably 90% of your organic matter and then your first flush system takes care of the rest. And you should have really nice clean rainwater arriving in your tank. It was a really fun little day. Um, having a look at uh, Daryl's beautiful homestead and like we said it's really going to be something that we will make a series of. He has so many awesome projects, an amazing flower garden, so many different things that would just take, it would take ages so we'd rather just turn it into short little clips. Um, the solar aspect is really something that could we could dive, we could do a little bit of a deep dive but for now it's just to show what we have and yeah it's just to keep a continuity keep the information flowing create a database uh, we're happy to
kind of, uh, if you would like to reach out, you have any questions and if we can answer or perhaps even point you in the right direction, uh, then we gladly do so. And yeah, just thanks for your time, your energy, and uh, please let us know what you'd like to know about. If there's anything here that you are interested in and we could perhaps uh, elaborate on, let us know. And until our next video, uh, thanks and uh, see you soon. Cheers. Thank you.